Matthew chapter 25, beginning at verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a, sep as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you, a stranger, and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick, or in prison, and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me, naked, and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you thirsty? hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you. Then he will answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Well, we come this morning to the final words of Jesus' great teaching seminar about the end of the world. We've been looking at this over the last eight weeks, and here are Jesus' concluding words. And this whole discourse, which has run through chapters 24 and 25, well, it's been teaching us about Jesus' return so that we know what to expect when he comes, we understand it, we know what to expect while we wait for him to come so that we might live as faithful and fruitful disciples that we might be ready for his return. And in fact, these words, they're not only the end of this discourse, but they're the last of Jesus' formal words of teaching in Matthew's gospel before his crucifixion. And they bookend his public ministry. So right back in chapter four, well, Jesus' first words as he began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then here, Chapter 25, he concludes by describing the day when the kingdom of heaven will come in all its fullness. So here is Jesus' final word about the end, and the subject is judgment. Now, this is a subject that we may find uh, in the world around us that many roll their eyes at. But when we pause to think about it, we find that we all believe in judgment and that we know it's a good thing. Just a glance at the newspapers, the news feeds. Well, there are all kinds of stories, aren't there? Stories of an injustice, stories that are calling for right judgment. It's been my observation that so much legislation now sort of seeks to close up perceived loopholes where an injustice might take place to, to kind of hedge round and ensure justice. In the world of sport, just vast amounts of energy have been uh, spent employing technology to kind of analyze every little decision to try and ensure every judgment is right, whether it's offside or handball or whatever it is. So we believe judgment is a good thing. We know justice is a good thing. And as we listen to Jesus' words this morning, well, if we've turned to him as Lord and Savior, there are words that are going to help us endure and to keep going as faithful and fruitful disciples. 
if we're not yet trusting Jesus, if we're here perhaps looking in on things this morning, looking in on the Christian faith, well, here we're presented with a description of the future which, if you like, shouts, well, wake up, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so we have three points this morning. Jesus will return to judge. There will be only two outcomes. And then finally, we'll see the basis of Jesus' judgment. So Jesus will return to judge. Verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. The Son of Man comes in his glory. The phrase Son of Man is a title. It's speaking of Jesus. It comes from the Old Testament book of Daniel. We said those words together uh, to one another slightly earlier. Uh, Daniel speaks of one who, like a son of man, will be given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, all nations and languages should serve him. So Jesus' return will be the visible, unmissable coming of this son of man who has dominion over all the world and authority as king to judge it. And so it is a scene of immeasurable glory. You think of the scene in a courtroom when a judge enters to give the verdict. Well, that's a, there's hush, there's a sense of awe. Or think of the coronation last year. Well, there we saw the trappings of human glory and splendor. But here we have the true and perfect judge, the king of all, um, all the world. And he will come with the awesome splendor of the host of heaven's angels to sit on his glorious throne. He's the one whose glory has been displayed in humility in his work of salvation at the cross and in majesty in his resurrection and ascension and now in power and authority as he sits on his glorious throne in judgment. And as I've been studying these verses, well, it's just made me think, do I have room in my view of Jesus for this scene, this Jesus? And do I believe that this day one day will come? Because here is described the moment of final judgment. And it is a moment of glory as perfect justice is delivered. But we also see it will be a comprehensive, if you like, universal judgment. We've seen Jesus tell us that the governing reality of the age we live in now between his first and second coming is the proclamation of the gospel to the nations. And on this day before him, will be gathered all the nations. Here is the Son of Man, Lord of all, whether or not we acknowledge him or not. And he'll summon every single person who's ever lived to come before his throne. And there'll be no exemptions from great to small, from Putin to pauper, from Trump to Trump. There'll be no claims of a rigged jury, no plea bargains, no miscarriages of justice. It will be universal, complete, comprehensive. And we also see it will be personal. In verse 32, he will separate people one from another. As a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. I'm told that that sheep and goats would have shared the pasture together up on the hills. But at night, they would normally be separated because the goats would want to gather together for warmth and the sheep of woollier coats, I guess, wouldn't need to. And sometimes these verses get called the parable of the sheep and the goats, but it's not strictly a parable. Jesus is plainly teaching us about his return, and he's using this illustration of the shepherd separating sheep and goats to describe this clear and personal separation, either to the right or to the left. It will be a personal judgment. And we live in a world and a culture that so easily can scoff at this. Oh yeah, that's the the judgment stuff again. But actually what we see in the world confirms Jesus' words all through this section. Jesus is risen, the tomb was empty, he's ascended. And if we remember back at the start of chapter 24, when Jesus described an era that would be characterized by wars and rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes, persecution... 
Well, we look at the world around us and we find everything that Jesus said would happen between his first and second coming is happening exactly as he said it would. And so when Jesus speaks of this day, we must take it seriously. And in the busyness and the complexity of 21st century life, well, actually, this helps us see that what matters is really quite simple. Because Jesus tells us the next great event will be his return to judge. And what matters more than anything else is our response to him. Jesus will return to judge. It will be a glorious scene, perfect justice. It will be universal. It will be personal. And it will be binary. That is, there will be only two outcomes. And this is our second point. There will be only two outcomes. The structure of Jesus' teaching after these first few verses goes on to describe two contrasting speeches. The speech given to those on the right, the sheep, and that's in verse 34 to 40. And then the speech given to those on his left, the goats, in verse 41 to 46. And both of them begin, if you like, with the verdict delivered. So it says, verse 34, then the king will say to those on his right, come. And verse 41, then he will say to those on his left, depart. So the verdict. And then following the verdict, well, the basis of the judgment is explained. And so we're going to consider the verdict first and take those in and then look at the basis of Jesus' judgment. And for those on the right, well, this will be a day of untold blessing. Verse 34, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. In Matthew's gospel, the call by Jesus to come is a really significant, significant call. Again, in chapter 4, as Jesus begins his ministry, he calls his first disciples with that same word, come after me. In chapter 11, Jesus issues the invitation, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. In chapter 22, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a wedding feast, and the invitation is, come to the wedding feast. And here is the scene. And wonderfully, all who have come to Jesus before he returns as judge, who've listened to his call, who've received him, will hear that word one more time. Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. This is the day when the fullness of the kingdom of heaven will come. The day the new creation promised by God the Father will be established in its fullness through the work of his Son. We've seen all kinds of pictures and foretastes of it in Matthew's gospel. Sickness and death will be banished. There'll be an end to mourning and sadness. It'll be like a rich wedding banquet. It'll be a kingdom of the fullness of life. And remarkably here, it's described as an inheritance. An inheritance prepared for all who trust in Jesus. A gift given by grace as to an heir. And so it's not simply the picture of being a welcomed guest. It's the picture of being a son or a daughter in the family. And we see that the whole picture, it presupposes a relationship with God the Father. Here's the Father, and here he is giving the inheritance to those who know him already. It's a summons to enjoy the face-to-face fullness of the relationship we have with God the Father by faith through Jesus, his Son. Inherit the kingdom. And it's to inherit the kingdom, to enjoy his personal presence forever. And that's how the parables all through this section portray it. The good and faithful servants were called to enter into the joy of your master. The wise and faithful manager was blessed when the master comes. The wise virgins went in with the bridegroom to the marriage feast to enjoy the personal presence of God And so here is the unshakable hope of the Christian, an inheritance kept in heaven for you, ready to be revealed in the last time. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom. And yet Jesus' judgment is binary. And in the parallel section, he describes, well, it speaks of a deeply sobering reality 
Verse 41, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And Jesus here is talking about hell. The 19th century bishop J.C. Ryle said of these verses, there are few passages in the whole Bible more solemn and heart-searching than this. The Oxford professor C.S. Lewis said of hell, there is no doctrine which I'd more willingly remove from Christianity than this if it lay in my power. But it has the full support of Scripture and especially of our Lord's own words. It has always been held by Christendom and it has the support of reason. Perhaps we consider, when we consider the seriousness, the sobering reality of hell, we might feel like Lewis. But as Lewis knew, Jesus teaches that hell is real. In Matthew's gospel alone, he speaks of hell 14 times. Indeed, as Jesus speaks and considers hell and judgment, he weeps, he laments over Jerusalem. And repeatedly, Jesus warns against hell. That's what he's doing right here in these final words of teaching before he goes to the cross. And supremely, Jesus went to the cross and died on the cross to save us from hell. As he faced the judgment we deserve, and as our substitute bore the punishment in our place to satisfy the righteousness of God. Scripture teaches the reality of hell. It's not novel. It's always been believed by Christians through all centuries. And here Jesus, as king and judge, speaks so we might understand what the future is like, what hell is like. Back in January this year, William taught a four-part series at the 6 p.m. service, looking at hell taught from Jesus' lips. There's more that can be said about it than, than can be said in our time here, but those talks will deal with many of the questions. But I think these verses teach three important things about hell and first is that it will be a place of isolation we see that in verse 41 he will say to those on his left depart from me you cursed those who reject Jesus in this life will be separated from him and all goodness for all eternity and Jesus describes that as to be cursed again through these chapters in the parables Jesus has spoken of that isolation The virgins who are not ready, well, the master says, truly I say to you, I do not know you. The wicked and slothful servant, well, says, cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. And here in verse 46, these will go away into eternal punishment. And so that old comment, at least my mates will be there. Well, it's tragically misguided. There'll be no friendship or love or goodness or light. It's right to say that in one sense, those who enter hell get what they wanted, a life apart from Jesus. But no one will want to be there. A place of isolation. And second, a place of retribution. Verse 46 describes hell as a place of eternal punishment. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. It is a place of just judgment. Well, we might empathize with C.S. Lewis in his desire to say that there is no hell. Well, if there were to be no just punishment of evil, and indeed the supreme evil of rejecting our maker, well, that would be truly unjust. The writer Randy Alcorn puts it like this. Hell is not pleasant, appealing, or encouraging, but neither is it evil. Rather, it is a place where evil is judged. Indeed, if being sentenced to hell is just punishment, then the absence of hell would itself be evil. Hell is a place of retribution. And third, it will be eternal. It's sometimes suggested that hell will not be eternal, that its inhabitants will be consumed in judgment so that their eternal death means cessation of existence. And this idea is called annihilationism. But it doesn't fit with what Jesus teaches here in verse 46. The verse 46 is what we might call a conscious parallel. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And the emphasis is eternal. Creation is, uh, the new creation is eternal. Hell will be eternal. 
Well, is this unfair? No, it's the proportionate response to the seriousness of rebellion against our maker. And there's no evidence in the New Testament that hell ever brings about genuine repentance. Sin continues as part of the punishment and the ground for it. And the reality today is that in his love and his mercy, our maker has entered into the world to take upon himself the judgment that we deserve in the person of Jesus Christ, that we might be saved. Alcorn again says, by denying hell, we deny the extent of God's holiness. When we minimize sin's seriousness, we minimize God's grace in Christ's blood shed for us. For if the evils he died for aren't significant enough to warrant eternal punishment, perhaps the grace displayed on the cross isn't significant enough to warrant eternal praise. It is eternal. Well, is this just Jesus trying to frighten us? I sometimes get asked how I became a Christian. I can't point to a particular time, but I do often remember at a young age praying that Jesus would forgive my sins. And I remember being conscious I didn't want to go to hell. Was I frightened by hell? Well, yes, if that means that I took Jesus' warning seriously, the need for forgiveness, and still do. I'm conscious this is hard teaching. It would be unusual for it not to have effect on us. It can be difficult for us to hear, particularly as we consider perhaps certain loved ones. And in that regard, I found the words of an experienced pastor helpful reminding me that we do need to discipline ourselves not to do God's job for him. We're not the judges of men and women and their response to Jesus. And we must trust that to our good and just Lord. If we are here this morning and we know that we have not come to Jesus for forgiveness, well, will we hear this as a warning and wake up? And as Jesus' disciples, well, surely this galvanizes us in our devotion together to our privileged commission with all the varied gifts and opportunities that we've been given to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom to the nations. Jesus will return to judge. There will be only two outcomes. But strikingly, Jesus then spends significant time in this passage telling us about the basis of his judgment. Why does he do this? Well, for the Christian, I think these words give us great assurance. They encourage us in Jesus' judgment to press on as faithful and fruitful disciples. And in his kindness here, well, Jesus also exposes false ideas of what it means to be ready for his return so that no one who hears this would presume they are ready when they're not. And so this is our third point, the basis of Jesus' judgment. Verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. These verses are sometimes taken to suggest that it is good deeds, acts of general kindness, charity, giving to, supporting, just being a good person are what get us into heaven. And that is the classic misunderstanding about Christianity, that our good deeds will somehow just be totted up. And if we hit the pass mark, well, then we'll be welcomed in. Well, that's not the gospel. And the key words that show us this is not the case, well, they're there in verses 40 and 45. See there in verse 40, the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And for verse 45, again, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. You see, the basis of Jesus' judgment is not charity or general good deeds, it's how a person has treated even the least of these, my brothers. Every time the word brothers is used in the New Testament, it refers to Jesus' followers and not just to humanity generally. It can be rightly translated brothers and sisters. It speaks of Christians. In Matthew 12, Jesus refers to his disciples as his brothers, and he does it again here. And so with the phrase, the least of these, it echoes the phrase little ones, which Jesus uses throughout Matthew's gospel to refer to his followers. 
And so what we have here is not Jesus saying he's going to be judging based on general good deeds, but on how we respond to his people. And again, it's not that these works themselves save us, but that these deeds of kindness to the people of God show that we've been born into his family through faith in Jesus. And there's another detail that really underlines this, and it's the detail of, of what causes a surprise in this passage. It struck me that there's no sense of surprise from those on the right or the left when Jesus judges. Those on the right know they are there because they have trusted Jesus. They already know God the Father. Those on the left are there because they've rejected Jesus. But what does cause surprise is seen in reaction to Jesus' explanation of his judgment. We see it in verse 37. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you? Or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? See, when Jesus lists all the ways that the righteous have served him, well, they are surprised. When, Jesus? We weren't with you when you walked on earth. When did we do it? And the surprise is there because actually, well, they just did it so naturally because they were part of God's family. It flowed almost unconsciously from their love for Jesus. These works display the person who's come to Jesus in faith for forgiveness and been born again into his family, taking on the family likeness and now having a concern for brothers and sisters in the family. I remember hearing a friend describe how they became a Christian. They said that at the first point, they didn't understand much about it, but they knew they wanted to read the Bible and meet with other Christians. Of course they did, because they were part of the family. This half term, I came across a kid's song with the chorus, there's no such thing as an invisible believer. And I guess the point of the song was to say, well, faith will show, it will, it will flow out because we're in Jesus' family. And Jesus says, I can see it. As we meet together and stand together as Jesus' followers, as we pray for one another, as we speak words of encouragement, in acts of love, hospitality, as we welcome, as we stand with those who suffer persecution for being Christian. And in this age of proclamation of the kingdom, where we work together as a family to serve one another and to make the gospel known to the nations, well, Jesus says, I can see it. And not only does he say he's seen it, but he says, I've received it. You did it to me. Isn't that a remarkable thought? As we serve one another in church, brothers and sisters, we serve Jesus. And so here he is forming his people into a loving family who together will serve one another and make his kingdom known. And he is with us in his work. Some of us will tend to be conscious of our weakness in love for others. The encouragement here is that Jesus is aware of what even we ourselves are not. And as we remember again who we are, well, we press on in service, strengthened by the knowledge of his grace, sure of an eternal inheritance, secured by our heavenly father. But to those who show indifference, or even hostility to Jesus' people, well, such actions expose, well, a rejection of Jesus himself. Someone might protest, I've never hurt anyone, I I don't hate Christians, I've just been getting on with life. And Jesus says, well, did you listen to my people? Did you receive them and their message? Did you line up with them in their persecution? Did you serve them out of love for me? See, just seeking to be a good person is not to be ready. Putting off the decision about Jesus is not to be ready. And Jesus' words here are a call to wake up, to come to him, to come to him today. Come after me, says Jesus. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Come to the wedding feast. And so if we recognize our need and come to Jesus now, well, we will be forgiven. And we will find ourselves born into his new family. And we'll find ourselves transformed with a concern, a new concern for his people. And then when he returns, we'll hear that word once again, come, you who are blessed by my father, 
inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you that he will come and bring perfect and just judgment. We thank you that when he comes, all who trust in him will hear those words, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom. And Father, as we consider the reality of hell in these verses as well, we ask that it would strengthen our resolve to make the good news of salvation in Jesus known. And so, Father, we thank you for membership of his kingdom and the great hope we have in our King. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.